The international response to the North Korean invasion of South Korea in 1950 was led by the United States, which provided the bulk of the non-Korean troops involved in the conflict. The second biggest foreign contingent came from Great Britain, but there were many smaller military contingents that are barely acknowledged today in the story of the Korean War, a long list that included several British Commonwealth nations like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and at the time India, and also nationalities not normally associated with international conflicts like Colombia, Sweden, Thailand, Luxembourg, even West Germany sent medical teams, not having at that time an army of its own. One of the most overlooked today was an empire very few people are familiar with. The Empire of Ethiopia, a nation located in northeastern Africa and, to most of us today, associated more closely with the terrible famines of the 1980s. But in 1950, Ethiopia was a quite different place. It was, for one thing, rare in that as an African country, it had mostly been able to stay independent of Europe's African empires. In 1896, it had decisively defeated a European power, something extremely rare in the 19th century, in this case Italy, leaving the Italians only in control of modern-day Eritrea to the north. That changed in 1935, when Italian dictator Benito Mussolini attacked Ethiopia, then known as Abyssinia, deploying chemical weapons to help overcome strong Ethiopian resistance. And the emperor, Haile Selassie I, and his family were forced into exile in England, living in a home in Bath between 1936 and 1941, until his nation was freed from Italian occupation by British Empire forces during World War II's East African Campaign. Post-war, the Ethiopian military was rebuilt, including receiving military aid from Sweden. The emperor was a strong supporter of the United Nations, so when the call went out in 1950 for UN member nations to provide military assistance to South Korea, Haile Selassie pledged to send an infantry battalion to help. This unit, called the Kagnu Battalion, was drawn from Haile Selassie's household troops, the Imperial Bodyguard Division. Intensive training was undertaken by Ethiopian troops in the country's mountainous regions to prepare them for combat in equally mountainous Korea. The 1st Battalion arrived in Korea by ship at Busan in May 1951 and was attached to US forces, receiving American uniforms, equipment and weapons to simplify their supply and to aid their identification during operations on the UN side. As can be seen from this film of arriving Ethiopian troops, their uniform actually more closely resembled British colonial uniforms of the period. The battalion numbered 1,200 officers and men, and in fact the units were rotated every so many months, meaning that several battalions of Imperial bodyguards saw service in Korea. It was the first time in Ethiopia's long history that an army had served outside of Africa. Moving forward to the UN camp outside Busan, the Kagnu Battalion was fully re-equipped by the United States and also given a refresher course in infantry tactics, as well as intensive training on US weapons. The 1st Battalion was attached to the US 7th Infantry Division and went into action for the first time on the 12th of August 1951, this unit dispatching platoon or company-sized reconnaissance units to raid North Korean lines and knock out outposts. When the US 9th Corps initiated an operation to capture Gyeongsong, the Kagnu Battalion attacked and occupied Hill 700 near Sangyon on the 21st of September 1951. The following day, backed by US artillery and air support, the Ethiopian battalion stormed and captured Hill 602. These two days of operations resulting in 179 enemies killed. US President Harry S. Truman would award the Kagnu Battalion a presidential unit citation for these actions. The 1st Battalion left for Ethiopia on the 28th of March 1952, being replaced the next day by the 2nd Battalion rotating from Africa. 
The new Cagnew Battalion joined the U.S. 32nd Infantry Regiment, the 7th Division, on the 13th of April, deploying after refresher training to the main defence line at Mount Junga. On the 4th of October 1952, the Cagnew Battalion's 4th Company, while patrolling, ambushed a large body of Chinese, killing 26. The 2nd Battalion saw more action in the hills at Galhua Dong, west of Cherwon, until replaced on the 16th of April 1953 by the 3rd Battalion sent from Ethiopia. Under heavy attack between the 15th and the 18th of May 1953, the Cagnew troops repulsed three strong Chinese assaults, defending a feature codenamed Hill Yoke. By the 20th of May, fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat took place around Hill Yoke between Ethiopian and Chinese troops, the Cagnew Battalion killing at least 110 of the enemy but keeping hold of their positions. For this achievement, the battalion was awarded by the South Korean president a citation. These actions were part of the wider Battle of Porkchop Hill, one of the United States Army's epic actions during the Korean War. In total, 3,520 Ethiopian soldiers fought in the Korean War between 1951 and 1953, suffering casualties of 121 killed and 536 wounded. The 3rd Battalion stayed on in Korea until the armistice was signed in 1954, and then rotated out being replaced by fresh Imperial Ethiopian troops that remained in Korea as part of the UN peacekeeping force until 1975. The US decorated many Cagnew Battalion personnel for the intense fighting alongside US troops of the 7th Division, Ethiopian troops receiving nine silver stars and several dozen bronze stars. Two officers received Ethiopia's highest award for gallantry, being appointed knights of the Order of Emperor Menelik II. When the US established a military base in Eritrea in 1953, it was named Cagnew Station in honour of the Ethiopian troops in Korea, and South Korea widely honoured the unit as well, including creating a monument to them. Sadly, the feats of the Cagnew Battalion were swept away in 1974 when Ethiopia fell under the control of a communist junta. The fact that the Cagnew Battalion and the veterans had fought against communism meant that it was targeted by the Soviet-backed regime and the Imperial Bodyguard Division was dissolved. However, since the fall of the communist junta in 1991, the Imperial Bodyguard Association has been free to commemorate its members' service in the Korean War, and several groups of veterans have visited South Korea as part of commemorations for their comrades who fell in the war so very far away from their African homeland. As for the emperor, Haile Selassie I, he was held in high regard by other world leaders, and by the 1970s was the longest-serving head of state in the world, having come to the throne in 1930. However, overthrown on the 12th of September 1974, the emperor and his family were imprisoned, and some were killed along with most of the government ministers, all without trial. Haile Selassie was reported to have died on the 27th of August 1975 from respiratory failure, but in reality it later emerged that he was strangled in his bed by turncoat military officers and buried in the palace gardens under a concrete slab. In 2000, his bones were reinterred with due ceremony at Holy Trinity Cathedral in Addis Ababa, the Ethiopian capital. His grandson, Crown Prince Zera Jacob Selassie, is the current heir to the throne of Ethiopia and is a graduate of Exeter College, Oxford and the Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst. He lives in Addis Ababa today. One interesting aside to this story is what became of the Emperor's English house. When Haile Selassie left the villa in 1941 to return to Africa, it was on his instructions used as a home for evacuated babies. In 1958, during a visit to the city of Bath, Haile Selassie donated the house to the city on the understanding that it would be used as a care home for the elderly.
and indeed it remained a care home until 1993 and is now a day centre used by many groups in Bath, including Age Concern, the Ethiopian Coptic Church and the Rastafari Church. Fairfield House contains a small exhibition about Hale Selassie and would appreciate any donations for its critical preservation as a community building used by many groups. Link in the description box below for more information. Many thanks for watching, please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.